In this video, we're going to continue our discussion on function inverses. This is lesson three of part one inside unit four for college algebra. And we talked about function inverses back in the second unit of this course when we spent our time talking about functions in general. So as a reminder, there are basically four big components or four things to consider while working with function inverses. And so the first point we have to remind ourselves of is that if a function is one-to-one, -one, then it has an inverse function. And one-to-one -one simply means that every input of the function, each element of the domain, has exactly one output in the range. And we had a test for that. That was called a horizontal line test. While the vertical line test verified whether a graph represents a function, the horizontal line test verified whether that function is one-to-one. -one. Secondly, the domain of the function is the same as the range of the function's inverse and vice versa. The function and its inverse are in a way opposites of one another. Every input of the function becomes the output of the inverse and vice versa. Now we've seen part three already this week, um, verifying inverses, so this, remember this f with a negative one power symbol, um, that's the symbol for an inverse function. To verify that um, f inverse really is the inverse of the original function, then we compose the function in both directions, and in both cases, when simplified, the result should be x. Now finally, this bulleted point number four, this is kind of new. We haven't talked about this one before, but the graphs of f and f inverse are symmetric with respect to the line y equals x. Now the line y equals x is this diagonal line here. Every x coordinate is exactly the same as the y coordinate on that line. And so unlike even an odd symmetry, this particular symmetry is reflectional reflectional symmetry, or maybe reflexive symmetry. I'm not quite sure what the uh, appropriate term would be there, but we'll figure that one out. Uh, reflectional or reflexive symmetry over the line. It's not rotational. So in the examples down below, I'd like to use the horizontal line test to determine which one is, uh, which one of these functions or which of these functions are one-to-one. -one. And since one-to-one -one functions do have an inverse, I'd like to sketch the inverse with that rule number four from above. So very quickly, um, the, vert, uh, I'm sorry, the horizontal line test would be if we drew a series of horizontal lines throughout the entire um, function, will this function ever strike any of these horizontal lines in more than one spot? And it doesn't look like that's the case here for number one. Any time that a horizontal line is drawn and it strikes the graph itself, there's only one point of intersection. Same thing over here with 20. 21, on the other hand, this graph here fails the vertical line test here. It also fails here and here and so on. So this one is not considered one-to-one. -one. And if it's not one-to-one, -one, then it has no inverse on this domain. Now, we could restrict the domain. It is possible for us to say, well, here's a function that's been created, but we only want to focus on this function for x values that are greater than or equal to 1, or greater than or equal to 0 in this case. If we restrict the domain, then this portion of the graph is one-to-one, -one, and this portion would have an inverse. That's going to be particularly helpful in our trigon uh, trigonometry class when we start talking about graphs of sine and cosine waves. In total, sine and cosine are not one-to-one, -one, but if we restrict the domain and focus only on a particular portion of the graph, well, a portion of the graph might be one-to-one -one and have an inverse after all. Number 22 is not one-to-one, -one, but 23 is. And then finally, 24. Well, within this function's domain, right here, if I were to draw a horizontal line right on top of the existing horizontal line, we'd have an infinite number of intersections. So again, we would say that this one is not one-to-one -one either. 
Now, as we sketch inverses, what I like to do is I like to find key data points or some points that seem fairly obvious in their location on the um, graph. And then if we reverse the x and y values of those coordinates, then we would find the points on function inverse. So I'm going to use my blue pen here to just remind ourselves that this blue graph is our function, f of x. And I'll use a red ink just to indicate our function inverse. And keeping in mind that there's this imaginary y equals x line for our point of symmetry, um, I have a feeling that um, f inverse is going to show up down here uh, somewhere to the bottom and right of this graph. Okay, so the key data points that I see, here's one right here. That's fairly obvious that this is the coordinate 0, 1. Um, right here, it's a little less obvious, but I think pretty close. This kind of looks to me uh, to be 1, 2. And then this one right here appears to be negative 1, 1 half. And so with those key data points, and I'm sure there could be others to find as well, I'm just going to reverse those. And instead of negative 1, 1 half, I'm going to go over 1 half and down 1. If this data point exists in the function, then this data point, 1 half, negative 1, has to exist on the inverse function because the input and the output have been reversed. Similarly, the coordinate 1, 0, and then the coordinate 2, 1 will exist in the inverse. Now if I were to connect these with a line, it might look something like this. And to me that looks pretty good. If I imagine the equation y equals x represented by this gray line right here, it certainly looks like, it certainly looks like there's reflection symmetry here. Uh, it was bothering me, I looked it up, the appropriate phrasing would be reflection symmetry. Not reflexive or reflectional, but reflection symmetry. Uh, this is also sometimes called, or also known as, mirror symmetry. Okay. I'm not a stickler for phrasing here as long as we understand what, what's happening. But again, with this reflection symmetry, this data point is reflected over the line y equals x, and this data point is reflected over the line y equals x. Every data point is reflected over the line y equals x. And from a geometric standpoint, that means that the uh, perpendicular distance between this data point and this line is the same as this perpendicular distance here. So there, there are uh, congruent line segments that would connect these data points. In example 20, I went ahead and located four uh, apparent key data points here. So what I would like for you to do is pause the video and plot these points on the function's inverse. And here again, if these coordinates existed in the function, then the reversal of those coordinates exist in the inverse function. And we can connect those with a smooth and continuous line because the inverse function is a function in and of itself. And we could also imagine that there is indeed the equation y equals x. The graph y equals x, if drawn correctly and carefully, I have to move this end point a little bit, uh, that does create a, a point of reflection. And we can see the reflection symmetry here as well. We said that 21 and 22 are not one-to-one, -one, but if you use the, the generic description that we've been using right now about reversing coordinates, um, you could potentially create an inverse. Um, the problem with the inverse function is that it won't be a function anymore at all. And we can oversimplify that by marking these data points. I don't think they're precise, but you'll get the idea when, I, when we change these. So with these three key data points forcing this U shape, almost like a parabola, uh, we have 0, 3, 3, 0, and negative 3, 0. When this data point 3, 0 is reversed, it shows up here at 0, 3. 
when this data point zero three is reversed, we end up down here at three zero. So those two data points land on top of one another. But then this data point negative three zero would be down here at zero negative three. And if we were to imagine those, um, those graphs or those points connected with the graph, we might see this sideways U shape. And again, in a sense, this is a, an inverse of the original function, but the problem is, is this graph no longer represents a function at all. This graph is uh, going to fail the vertical line test. And for that reason, we, we're not going to really be spending time focusing on those right now. We're going to be focusing on functions that contain or that have an inverse in this unit. Now number 23 is pretty interesting. Um, I know the data points are a bit hard to interpret without grid lines and, and uh, without a function to actually calculate the coordinates. But based on what I see here, these are four data points that exist on the graph. Uh, when x is a quarter, y is a, is a value of 3. When x is a half, y is 2. When x is 2, y is a half. And when x is 3, y is a quarter. Do you notice anything interesting about these data points if I were to reverse them? Well, this 1 fourth 3 ends up be, uh, displaying itself down here at 3 comma 1 fourth and vice versa. 3 1 fourth uh, becomes 1 fourth 3. In fact, all of these data points invert onto themselves. And so that's pretty interesting. We would call this a self-inverse, or we would say that the function is self-invertible. The function is its own inverse. So in mathematical language, we might say that f of x is equal to f inverse of x. And that's pretty unique. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, finding invertible functions is a challenge in and of itself, but finding self-invertible functions is even more rare. With example 24, again, we have um, a function that's not one-to-one. -one. If I were to invert you know, all of these data points that would exist uh, in this graph, what we would end up creating is a perfectly vertical line right here. And clearly this line is not a function. It fails the vertical line test. So we won't pursue it much further in this particular unit. I'm going to erase this so that I can read my instructions a little bit more clearly. And in these two examples, we're going to verify that the functions are inverses. And to do so, if you recall, we simply compose both functions with themselves, and we hope to see that the result ends up being x each time. The instructions do go on to say to give any values of x that need to be excluded from the domain of f and g, but I've selected these two problems because they are, well, they're linear equations, which are a form of polynomial, and there are no restrictions. So for this particular set, we don't need to identify any exclusions because I know that there won't be. So let's just focus on finding the, or verifying the inverses. If we compose f with g in this order first, that means that f is our outer function, and we need 3 times something plus 4. And our inner function is 1 third quantity x minus 4. Now, to properly verify this, we really should follow the order of operations. We're not solving an equation here, so we don't go backwards through the order, but we're simplifying the right-hand side, so we need to directly follow the order of operations. And that says to start at the innermost parentheses. Well, there's nothing we can do on the innermost parentheses, but as we step outward from that, we can distribute the one-third. So I know that there's a tendency to want to distribute this three to the one-third first because they're right next to one another, but in essence, that really does violate our order of operations, and we could potentially see some problems if we start getting used to doing that. So let's not make that happen. Instead, we have to distribute this one-third to both components inside this grouping symbol. We'll call it one-third x minus four-thirds. Now we can distribute in this three because there's nothing else we can do on the innermost parentheses, and we'll continue with our multiplication from left to left to write across this expression. Now we see x minus 4 plus 
4, and we can combine any like terms, and we are left with x, which is exactly what we wanted. Now, had you distributed at the beginning in this example, you would have ended up with the same result here, and many times you can probably get away with that, but I do need to stress the importance that the order of operations is well defined uh, for all of us to follow so that we can obtain the same result every single time. If you distributed out of order here and got the same result, well, to be perfectly honest, that's just pure luck, and it won't always work that way. So we really do need to um, force ourselves to follow the order of operations very carefully. Now, in, um, in accordance with the instructions to verify inverses, we can't just do this in one direction. We've got to verify in the second direction as well. So I'm writing g of x on the outside, which would be one-third times something minus 4, and the something on the interior this time has to be 3x plus 4. Here again, if we follow the order of operations from the innermost parentheses, there's nothing that can be done, so we'll start stepping outward from that, and 3x plus 4 minus 4 does become 3x by itself, and then uh, one-third times 3x is x. So since we've obtained x in both cases, we've now confirmed that f and g are inverses. And we've got to show that with both sets of checks. I would like for you to try number 34 on your own, so please pause the video now and resume playback in a moment to check your work. So I used um, the other composite notation here, f composed with g using that open circle uh, composite notation, but if you showed nested notation, that's fine too. I did want to emphasize that the order of operations was followed in both cases, and in both cases, we did end up with x. So therefore, we can say that f of x and g of x are inverses. We may even say something like this, that f inverse of x is equal to g of x, and we may also say that g inverse of x is equal to f of x. And that would be just a mathematical statement that shows that the inverse of f is g and the inverse of g is f. For the last of this video, we're going to take a look at three of these six problems, and I would challenge you to try the other three on your own and see me if you need any help or clarification with them. Uh, but we are told that the function in, in each problem is one-to-one, -one, so we need to find the inverse and check our answer, and then we can graph f, f inverse, and y equals x on the same axes. So we'll do that with the TI Inspire just to check our work. Now before I get too far, let's take a look at number 55 real quick. Why on earth do they have this extra phrase here? We've got f of x equals x squared plus 4, x greater than or equal to 0. Why would that extra phrase be added here? Well, as it turns out, this is a domain restriction. We're saying that we want the function x squared plus 4, and if you recall, x squared plus 4 is going to be a parabola that opens upward and it starts here at the coordinate 0, 4. Now, this particular graph is not 1 to 1. However, if we only focus on x values that are greater than or equal to 0, then we can eliminate this side of the graph, and now we're dealing with a function that is 1 to 1 and therefore invertible. And it's worth noting, too, that when we do find the inverse, what we're going to see is an equation that looks like this, also kind of looks like a parabola, but it only works for y values that are greater than or equal to zero because the range of the inverse is the same as the domain of the original function. Okay, so with that being said, the math isn't going to be all that different for number 55. We just gotta be aware of and accustomed to these restrictions. So let's try number 53, and I'll remind you that we have basically three steps to finding 
inverses. And step one is to change the f of x notation back to y, because that's going to make step two a little bit easier and more meaningful. And that's where we switch our x and y. We literally switch the input and the output variables. And with those switched, we will solve for the new y. And this new y that we solve for is our inverse function. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and do this. For number 53, we're going to change this to y equals x cubed minus 1. And if we switch, we now have x equals y cubed minus 1. And now we solve for y. So we've got x plus 1 equals y cubed. And if we take the cube root of both sides of the equation, then now we're left with y equals the cube root of x plus 1. Remember, this y that we started with and this y that we ended with are not the same, and that's because this one up here was the original function, and this one down here is our inverse. So the inverse of f, we think, is the cube root of x plus 1. Now we should verify that. We should verify that to be certain. And if we check by composing f with f inverse, sorry, that's prime notation, inverse, if we um, compose the two in that order, as it turns out, when simplified, both do end up equaling x, and therefore we've confirmed that these two are indeed inverses. So we have our original function and our inverse function. Let's see what they look like when we graph them on the calculator. I'm going to add a graphs page, not a calculator page, and we'll graph the first function, which was x to the third power minus 1. And we need to graph the second equation, so I'll press the tab key to activate that formula bar. And the inverse function that we have here is the cube root, so I'll press the nth root key. We'll indicate that our index is 3, so the cube root of x plus 1. There we go. And then just for curiosity's sake, if we graph the function y equals x, or f of x equals x, there's that diagonal line. And it looks to me, certainly, that this has reflection or mirror symmetry. If I were to identify any point on the blue graph, any coordinate on that blue graph, and reverse its x and y coordinates, it would end up on the red graph. And the points on the red and blue graph are equally distant from one another when measured perpendicular to this mid line. So if you're using this calculator on your computer, what's really nice is that uh, you can press this button here on the screen, and this will take a screenshot. It will capture that page. And if you had, say, an electronic copy of your work or something like that, and you wanted to, uh, to uh, copy and paste the actual picture from the calculator, you can do that. So we'll uh, right-click on, on my uh, electronic ink here and press Paste, and now I've got the picture. Now, if you're doing your work on paper at home and uh, you wanted to print this out and include it with your notes, that would be perfectly fine, too. Uh, I just thought I'd share that with you, that, there, that it is possible just to capture the screen. Now, you'll notice that my cursor was included on that screenshot, and that's kind of the downfall of, of this particular software. If your cursor is there and active on the screen, it will be picked up as well. So you might want to get in the habit of moving your cursor off to a different side of the screen first before you take the screenshot. For number 55, we're actually going to approach this much the same way, and we'll just keep the, um, the notion of this domain restriction in the back of our mind. We've got f of x equals x squared plus 4. So uh, I've changed that to y equals, and now I'm going to switch the letters around so that x is equal to y squared plus 4. 
We can subtract 4 from both sides. Then take the square root and find that y is equal to the square root of x minus 4. Now, since we had to apply the square root, it was not part of the original expression, then we should be careful and consider both positive and negative results. A y is equal to the positive square root of x minus 4, and y is equal to the negative square root of x minus 4. But recall, back here, we were restricting our domain and said that x must be greater than or equal to 0. So now that we found an inverse, now that we found our inverse, we must restrict our domain to be y values that are greater than or equal to 0. So again, at the original, the domain values were greater than or equal to 0. So in the inverse, the range values are greater than or equal to 0. The domain and range are simply reversed. Well, in that case, when we look at this particular function, we want y values that are positive. Well, the only way we'll get y values that are positive is if we eliminate this negative component of the uh, expression. And if we have this plus sign here, we don't really need to see that either. So now we're saying that the inverse of our original function, of our original function back here, x squared plus 4, is the square root of x minus 4. We don't have to worry about that plus or minus sign. And we can check this with math, much the same way that we did before. And the check procedure works out just the same as it has already. When f is composed with f inverse, we end up with x as a result. And when f inverse is composed with f in that order, we also end up with x as a result. So I'll jump back to the calculator now and take a look at that image. We'll see if the pictures support our claim as well. And I'll point out here that if you've got your uh, graphs page full, if you press this delete key three times in a row, that'll prompt you asking if you want to delete everything. And we can say yes to that. That way we don't have to create a new document. And here's the graph for x squared plus 4. And I think there's a way to restrict the domain in this function. I think we can type comma x and then jump into this option here. Um, so I'm using the options above this equal sign. So we want x greater than, whoops, I'm getting an, an error there. I think I know what the problem is. Um, I needed to use a different input option at the beginning here. So let me, uh, let me delete everything again. And when we insert our function, I'm going to press this key here. And I'm going to select um, this option. So this option here is going to essentially create a piecewise function for us. We don't need the second row. But um, if I use this notation, We'll um, be able to define our function here in this first row and its restriction. So let me try this one more time. x squared plus 4. And this is only good for x values that are greater than or equal to, there we go, 0. And I don't need this second row. There we go. And so now with this brace, uh, we were able to provide a domain restriction. And here's that graph. Now, we won't need to apply that domain restriction in the um, inverse function, because it's already essentially restricted by nature of the positive square root. And so if we, gra I don't know why my screen keeps flashing like that, but hopefully that's better. Uh, so when we graph this one, the square root of x minus 4, and press Enter, there's our um, second graph. And let's see here. If I graph now, finally, uh, the function y equals x, there's our line of symmetry. All right, so hopefully that helps you out. We um, now have the ability to graph. And you can practice this on your own. You're, you can graph with domain restrictions so that we only see a portion of the graph that's necessary. And we've also discussed different ways to screen capture your image and paste it in an electronic doc document if needed.
We'll try that again. We'll paste the image. There we go. And now we've got, again, the graph is in our document, which can be saved or printed as needed. Well, I hope that clarifies some things and you get some extra practice with your function inverses. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks for watching.